Good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you all and to bring God's Word. So if you have a Bible with you uh, this morning, please take it out and uh, turn with me uh, to the New Testament, to the book of Philippians. So last night when all of you were uh, anxiously sitting on your couches, wondering if the Leafs were going to break your heart again, um, my wife and I went to the symphony because we're, we're pretty high classical that way. And um, uh, one of my favorite parts was that, that the music would, would build sometimes into these crescendos and get to this climax. Uh, and it would just be like, like, and it gives you all goosebumps. It's kind of like uh, that feeling when you, uh, you know, watch Tavera score in overtime or something like that. It's a, it's a, it's a big moment. So this passage that I'm going to read with you, Philippians 2, it's kind of like that in the New Testament. It's, it's, a, it's a climactic uh, point in the New Testament. It's in a beautiful summary of God's word, a beautiful summary of the gospel. So we're just going to read a few verses before we go to our text. So Philippians chapter 2, looking at verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest places and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And now turn with me uh, to the Old Testament, uh, to the book of Jeremiah. A fun fact, Jeremiah is the longest book in the whole Bible. It takes up almost 6% of the whole Bible. It was written uh, 600 years before uh, Jesus walked the earth. So we're just going to read the passage first, the text and, the, and, the, and some verses before that. And then in the sermon itself, I'm going to explain a little bit more of the historical context. So our text is Jeremiah 38, verses 1 to 13, but we're going to back up to Jeremiah 37 and start at verse 11 and read that into our text. So Jeremiah 37, starting at verse 11. After the Babylonian army had withdrawn from Jerusalem because of Pharaoh's army, Jeremiah started to leave the city to go to the territory of Benjamin to get his share of the property among the people there. But when he reached the Benjamin gate, the captain of the guard, whose name was Arijah, son of Shemaliah, son of Hananiah, arrested him and said, you are deserting to the Babylonians. That's not true, Jeremiah said. I'm not deserting to the Babylonians. But Arijah would not listen to him, and said he arrested Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. They were angry with Jeremiah and had him beaten and imprisoned in the house of Jonathan the secretary, which they had made into a prison. Jeremiah was put in a vaulted cell in a dungeon, where he remained for a long time. Then King Zedekiah sent for him and had him brought to the palace, where he asked him privately, Is there any word from the Lord? Yes, replied Jeremiah, that you will be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon. It's not a great message. Then Jeremiah said to King Zedekiah, What crime have I committed against you or your attendants or this people that you have put me in prison? Where are your prophets who prophesied to you the king of Babylon will not attack you or this land? But now, my lord the king, please listen. Let me bring my petition before you. Do not send me back to the house of Jonathan, the secretary, or I will die there. King Zedekiah then gave orders for Jeremiah to be placed in the courtyard of the guard and given a loaf of bread from the street of the baker each day until all the bread in the city was gone. So Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. And here's our text this morning. 
Shephatiah, son of Matan, Gedaliah, son of Pasher, Jehukal, son of Shemaliah, and Pasher, son of Milkiah, heard what Jeremiah was telling all the people when he said, This is what the Lord says. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. They will escape with their lives. They will live. And this is what the Lord says. This city will certainly be given into the hands of the army of the king of Babylon, who will conquer it. Then the official said uh, to the king, This man should be put to death. He is discouraging the soldiers who are left in this city, as well as all the people, by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of those people, uh, but but their ruin. He is in your hands, King Zedekiah answered. Uh, the, the king can do nothing to oppose you. So they took Jeremiah, and they put him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which is in the courtyard of the guard. They lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern. It had no water in it, only mud. And Jeremiah sank down into the mud. But Abimelech, a Cushite, an official in the royal palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. While the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, Abimelech went out to the palace and said to him, My lord the king, uh, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death when there is no longer any bread in the city. Then the king commanded Abimelech the Cushite, Take thirty men from here uh, with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Abimelech took the men with him and went to a room under the treasury in the palace. He took some rags and worn out clothes from from there and let them down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. Abimelech the Cushite said to Jeremiah, put these old rags and worn clothes under your arms and and pad to pad the ropes. Jeremiah did so. And they pulled them up with the ropes and lifted them out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. This is the word of the Lord. So what are we going to do with this? Let's start with prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for running after us. We thank you for bringing us your word this morning in this passage in the Old Testament. We pray that you would open our eyes to the gospel here that we would feel your presence here with us, that you would fill us uh, with your spirit and show us more and more who Jesus is, why he came to die for us. Lord, we pray that you would open all all of our hearts and help us to see your glorious gospel this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, to say that the prophet Jeremiah was in uh, dire straits, uh, that he was stuck between a rock and a hard place, uh, would be classic understatement. Uh, the situation that he found himself in, uh, in human perspective, it was hopeless. It was hopeless. Well, if you're unfamiliar with this passage, or, or even with the book of Jeremiah, uh, you might be wondering, uh, how, do, how do we get here? H- how do we get to the nation of Israel being uh, under siege from these people, the Babylonians? And who is this prophet Jeremiah, and and why is he here? Why is he in a cistern? So allow me just to give a a few uh, historical uh, orientation, help us us to orientate ourselves around this text. Uh, Like I said, this story happens around 600 years before Jesus uh, was born. In the world at large, there are two uh, nations that are clamoring for power. In in the north, we have the up-and-coming nation of Babylon. And they're slowly gaining ground and, and conquering the world. And in the south, we have the uh, steady, eddy, you know, pretty consistent nation of Egypt. And they're fighting against each other. Um, some of you may be old enough that you lived through the Cold War, Cold, uh, War era. And, and it's kind of like that, where you have um, the USA and you have Russia um, just as these world powers. And, and everyone else is kind of stuck in the middle. The nation of Israel is is in the middle, and it's deciding, okay, which, which nation am I going to uh, align with? Which one am I going to back? And in the larger history leading up to this passage, uh, things have gone 
progressively from, from bad to worse for the nation of Israel. The nation as a whole, they, they had turned their back on God, and they did all kinds of uh, terrible, wicked things. And, and God was not okay with this, and so he sent uh, his prophet Jeremiah to warn them of the coming judgment uh, by this great superpower, by this great world power, Babylon. And that's exa- exactly what happened. Babylon had actually already shown up uh, a few years before this story happened. Right, so they, they, they came in to Jerusalem. Uh, the king's name was Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of Babylon, and he came in, and he just took whatever he wanted. He took treasures. Uh, he took um, uh, 10,000 captives. He took all the best soldiers. He took all the, the tradespeople, the electricians, the plumbers, the framers, the masons. They're all, they're all gone. There's no one left, really, that has a skill trade in Jerusalem, and it's, and it's not a great situation. He even takes the king of Jerusalem at the time, and he hauls him back to Babylon, and he takes this other man. We read him in the text. His name is Zedekiah. And he makes him king. He makes him, a, it's, it's called the puppet king. So if you're loyal to me, King Zedekiah, uh, I'll let you rule as you wish. But if you betray me, I'm coming after you. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said to him. Well, King Zedekiah, he doesn't stay loyal to Nebuchadnezzar. He, he decides to play politics and he turns away and he joins over to the team Egypt, to the pharaoh, to the king of Egypt. And so because of this, the full wrath of Babylon was going to descend on to Jerusalem. Destruction, it was coming for Jerusalem. And, and Jeremiah, he's the prophet that God sent to warn the people. And he does everything he can to do that. And so now we come to chapter 38. Um, the story, it's not very complicated, right? It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, Jeremiah shares this message. The people uh, reject the message. He gets left for dead and a cistern. And then this fellow, Ebed-Melech, comes along and he pulls him out of the cistern. So, so why are we looking at this story this morning? And what, what's here for us? Where is the gospel in this story? Well, what we'll see is that both Jeremiah and Ebed-Melech, they show us uh, something of Jesus Christ. And they show us something of his humiliation and his saving work. And, and the trajectory of this story is, is a trajectory that you see all through Scripture. It's this, this downward momentum, this downward trajectory, only to be reversed by this, this upward trajectory. And what we'll discover this morning is, is that the response to the message of God, the response uh, to the events of Easter, to the resurrection, to the, to the cross, to the, the judgment that is coming, it can have several responses. It can be responded to in rejection. It can be responded to in in uncertainty. Or it can be embraced. And so let's let's dig into this passage, and we're going to do that by looking at this theme, a seemingly hopeless situation, completely under the providence of God. And I split it up into two parts. It's not very original, but it kind of splits up the text nicely. We're going to first look at the descent uh, into the cistern, and then the resurrection out of the cistern. So point number one, the descent into the cistern. Well, I'm sure that many of you have been to professional sports events before. I got a picture here of the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Has anyone uh, been to one of those games before? A couple of you from Hamilton, the loyal ones. Maybe you've been to a Blue Jays game or or, um, even a Toronto Maple Leafs game or something like that. Uh, and you, you know what it's like, right? You stand in the, in the, in the stands and, and you're cheering for your home team and maybe you have those big number one finger things or those horns um, that you think are cool and everyone around you hates. And, and you love it. You, you, you love the cheering. One of my favorite parts of being at those sports events is when uh, the lights all dim right in the beginning, right? And they get those roaming lights going through the stadium and uh, uh, they get that pump-up music going and then the commentators start shouting over the megaphone saying, this is the hometown heroes. And the, they come onto the court or the ice or the, or the pitch or whatever. But I want you to imagine just for a minute uh, that you're sitting in, in, the, in the stadium and instead of all the lights and the music and all that stuff, it's just, it's just really quiet. And um, the commentators, they, they come on and they're like, okay, um, hometown people are coming in. Uh, they're taking the field. And the hometown people are, are coming in, the, the, the home team. 
and they're coming onto the field, and all of a sudden the commentators just shout, sh- shouting over the megaphone, uh, hey, you need a forfeit. You don't, you don't have a chance of winning. You, you, you should just throw in the towel now. You, don't even play. You should just, there's no way you're going to win. Well, that would be uh, quite demoralizing for the, for the home team, as you can imagine. The, the situation in, in Jerusalem, in Jeremiah 38, is, it's something like that. It's, it's similar like that, but the stakes are, are so much higher. It's not just a, a win or a lose in a sports game. No, it's, it's the lives of every single man, woman, and child in the city. And, and the players, they're the people living in Jerusalem. They're the soldiers that are guarding uh, the wall. And you have the prophet Jeremiah urging all the people that their only chance for survival, their only chance, is surrender. Throw up the white flag. Go over to the enemy. That is their only chance. Surrender to the Babylonians. And the soldiers on the wall, they're, they're hearing this message day after day. And as you can imagine, it's really taking a blow at their courage and at their confidence. And so it's no wonder that we read in verse 1, we have these uh, several palace officials hearing Jeremiah's message, and, and they're just furious about it. We read in chapter 37 uh, that these officials that were left in Jerusalem, they had already dealt with Jeremiah in this message once before. In in chapter 37, verse 15, we read that the officials were just enraged with Jeremiah. They they beat him, they they threw him into a dungeon, and they probably thought to themselves, okay, good, we took care of him. We're not going to hear of his message of, of, of treason ever again. He's taken care of. Uh, but, but soon they, they realize uh, that the king had pulled him out of that dungeon and, and placed him in the court of the guard. And, and Jeremiah, he clearly hadn't learned his lesson from his stint in prison because he's still at it with this message that would have been considered high treason. But, but treason, that's not Jeremiah's intention. No, his, his message is not born out of a lack of uh, patriotism or fear for his personal safety or, or personal advantage. No, it's, it's nothing like that. No, he's the spokesperson of God. And you can see when you read through Jeremiah that he has a deep concern for the well-being of God's people. There would be no escape without surrender. That was the message, and it certainly wasn't a popular message, but it was a truthful one. It was a message straight from God. But the people in Jerusalem, and especially these officials, they, they reject Jeremiah, and they reject his message. Well, what we read is the officials, they regroup, they gather together, and they, they go to the king. And they say to him, all right, so we, we thought we took care of this guy, Jeremiah. But you, uh, Mr. King Zedekiah, you, you seem to be okay with this city falling to the Babylonians. We're losing the heart of the soldiers. Don't you see that? They won't want to defend the city if Jeremiah keeps up with this message and he keeps demoralizing the people. He has, he has to go. You know, he has to die. And King Zedekiah, he, he, he caves. He caves to the pressure of these officials and he hands him over to them. Now I wonder who, who does... Uh, who does King Zedekiah remind you of? You know, when I, when I read this, I think that King Zedekiah would have got along really well with Pontius Pilate, don't you think? Both of them don't really know what to do with the prophet of God, with Jesus. And so they, they don't want to really commit to anything, so uh, they just want to pass off the responsibility to someone else. Uh, you take care of it, right? I don't... I don't want his blood on my hands. He doesn't really go one way or the other. He just hands him over. And so they take Jeremiah and they lower him into this district. Now our our friends in the archaeology department, they tell us what these uh, cisterns typically look like. I have a picture here. 
they're typically uh, three feet wide at the, at the mouth, and they go down around that width for a couple of meters, and then they, they come to this massive cavernous pit. They probably didn't have ladders, otherwise Jeremiah probably could have climbed out. Um, but that's sort of what they look like. And you can imagine that if you're stuck in a pit like this, there's no way of getting out. You can't climb the walls. You're in a hopeless uh, situation. This particular cistern uh, that Jeremiah was stuck in uh, had no water in it, but only mud, we read. And he sinks down into the mud. These officials, they, they essentially left him for dead. They're, they're kind of clever, actually, if you, if you think about it. Uh, they didn't want to do the deed themselves. They didn't want to do the execution themselves. So what they, what they did instead was they threw him in this pit of this, this hopeless situation where he's, he's going to die. And then they could just write him off, right? He's just another unfortunate casualty of the harsh conditions of the siege. And his name is just going to be added to that list of people that, that died that way. And, you know, when, when people find themselves in, in these kind of situations, right, these, these situations of hopelessness, these troubling situations, they often uh, take a moment and they, and they think, yeah, how, how did I get here? You know, maybe you, you found yourself in something like that before, right, where you're, where you're in a bad or, or really a terrible situation and you really only have time to think about it. You know, sometimes we, we end up in these situations because of, of things we've done. Or maybe sometimes because of uh, things that have been done to us. Well, in Jeremiah's case, his circumstances, they were directly related, directly uh, connected to his faithfulness. Uh, he had a message directly from God. And because of that, he, he's not going to back down. It wasn't uh, his message. It was God. And the people uh, who should have listened, right? The people in Jerusalem, they were the ones that rejected the message. They were the ones that rejected the prophet. You know, maybe in that pit, uh, he reflected. You know, he reflected on the years and years of preaching the same message to these people and, and no one listening. You know, all his life, he, he could look at his all his life, he, he lived a life of suffering and, and out of abuse. Right, we read it in, in the passage just before that, that, that uh, they took him and, and they, they beat him up. His life was marked with suffering after suffering. Down. He, he was thrown into a dungeon. Down. He was released from that dungeon, but only uh, to be thrown into a pit of mud, left for dead. Down. This, this downward trajectory is also what we see in the life of of Jesus Christ, the humiliation of Jesus. Right, he, was, he was the eternal, perfect Son of God. And, and we read in Philippians 2 before, before the sermon that it said, He who, uh, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, rather he made himself nothing. Down taking on the nature of a servant, down. A, a baby born to a virgin in an obscure village, down. He, he entered into this hopeless pit of this world with us, down. Surrounded by sickness, by brokenness, and by death, down. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, down. He became Obedient, down. He was rejected by the very people who should have listened, down. He was beaten, and he was mocked, and he was abused, down. He was crucified unjustly on a Roman cross, down. The wrath of God for sin was upon him. And he died, and he was buried in a tomb, down. In the pit where Jeremiah found himself, all he had to hold on to was this promise that God made to him when he, when he first called him to be a prophet. 
That, that's, that's all he had. I, I have it here. This is from chapter 1. God said to Jeremiah, you must, not, you must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. And then he says, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you. In our passage, we don't hear the thoughts of Jeremiah in this cistern. Uh, but let me show you something just so beautiful. Put your finger in chapter 38 and flip forward just one book to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3. Now the author is not listed in Lamentations. He's not identified. But, but most scholars agree that it's likely Jeremiah who's writing this. And in chapter 3, verse 53, I think we get a picture in poetic form of what it was like for Jeremiah to be in this pit. Read with me chapter 3, starting at verse 53. They tried to end my life in a pit and threw stones at me. The water closed over my head and I thought I was about to perish. I called on your name, Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near when I called you, and you said, do not fear. You, Lord, took up my case, and you redeemed my life. God speaks to Jeremiah in this pit, and he says, do not fear. Do not fear. Why, why shouldn't I fear God? Right? The situation uh, around Jeremiah is, is hopeless. He's as good as dead in this pit. But God, he wasn't done with his prophet. He still had a task for him. And his providential care, it had never left Jeremiah. It had never left Jeremiah. Even in this seemingly hopeless situation, God was going to send him a redeemer. He was going to send him a rescuer. And he was going to rescue him out of this pit. He was going to get Jeremiah out of the cistern. And that's what we'll see in our second point. The resurrection out of the cistern. So take a look at uh, verse 7 with me. Here we meet the answer to Jeremiah's cry for help. Uh, a Cushite, a eunuch, a man named Ebig Melech. Uh, he's a really uh, interesting guy, uh, and he reminds me a lot of a character in one of Jesus' parables. Uh, the one, you're probably familiar with it, the, the one about the Good Samaritan. Right, the, the, the story goes, right, the one guy gets beat up by some robbers on the side of the road and, and uh, essentially left for dead. And then a, a priest comes down the road and, and he looks over and he says, no, nah, I'm not touching that. And he passes right by this man and he keeps going down the road. And then you have a, a Levite come down and uh, he, he walks past and he you know, sees the, the man uh, all broken up on the road and crosses the other side of the street and keeps going. I'm not touching that. And then someone who you don't expect to help this man comes along, and, and he's a Samaritan. He's this unlikely character, and he helps uh, this man beaten up on the road. And you know, in our, in our, our text in Scripture, in, in, in Jeremiah 38, especially when, when the author wants to emphasize something, when he wants to point our eyes at something, he he. He draws emphasis to it, not by uh, underlining things, not by uh, making it bold or something like that or capitalizing the letters. No, what, what he does is he uses repetition. So I want, to, I want you to see this. Look at this. In verse 7, he's called Abimelech the Cushite. In verse 10, he's called Abimelech the Cushite. And in verse 12, he's called Abimelech the a Cushite. Did, did you all catch that? He's a Cushite. And, and, you know, all through the Bible, God has a wonderful way of reaching down and using the most unlikely people to show everyone <clears throat> that all the glory belongs to him. See, see Abig Melech, he's this unlikely hero in this story. And he's unlikely for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, he's a foreigner. He, he's a Cushite. 
Some of you uh, with some Bible, with a uh, different translation of the Bible, it might say uh, Abimelech the Ethiopian. That's because he's from this region uh, below Egypt in Ethiopia. He wasn't a Jew. He was an African. He wasn't one of God's people. He was a, an outsider. He was, he was a servant. He, his name literally means Ebig, servant or slave, Melek of the king, servant of the king. And further we read that he was a, a eunuch. And eunuchs were servants. They were boss. They often uh, could hold pretty high positions in court, but, but all the same, uh, they, they were servants. And so if there's anyone in Jerusalem, if there's anyone in Jerusalem who would have had a bad attitude towards the Jews, it would be Abimelech, right? He's, he's captured, he's purchased, he's renamed, and chances are he's emasculated. He's the guy that you would expect to show the Babylonians the back way into Jerusalem or, or, or lead a revolt against the city. But, but that's not the type of character that we see here. Now, as we, as we read through this narrative, there's, there's actually four things that I think we can really uh, learn from Epic Malik. Now, this isn't the main point, but I think it's a good point. Because there's good instruction here for us as Christians on how we are uh, to live the Christian life and how we are to come alongside others. So let me show you this. Just as we walk through, let me show you the, the, the four characteristics that we can learn from Eben Melech. Number one, boldness. He was bold. He was, he was bold because he had courage and he had compassion. Right? He, he heard uh, the, the trouble that Jeremiah was in, and, and he could have just hide, hid away somewhere in the palace. He could have just uh, said, you know, this is none of my business. I'm not going to get, get into this. But that's not what he does. He, he makes a beeline right for the king. He goes straight for the king. He was, he was bold. Second, he was, he was motivated by a sense of justice, right? He, he saw the injustice of the situation, and he called it out. In verse 9, we see, we see him say this, uh, these men have done evil. Th- this isn't right. He assesses uh, the hopeless situation that Jeremiah is in, and he says to the king, uh, we got to pull him out. If we don't do something, he's going to die. So he has this sense of justice. So he was bold. He has justice. And thirdly, uh, he's a planner. You know, it's, it's perhaps quite easy uh, to get ourselves into situations uh, where we, we can get upset about things, right? We can see injustice. Uh, we can voice our concerns. But, but when push comes to shove, someone comes up and says, okay, what are you going to do about it? Well, sometimes we're like, oh, I'm just the talker guy. I don't, I'm not the doer guy. It's, that's okay. We need talkers too. But, 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 but Ebbing Malik, he's not like that. He, he's got a plan. He knows what he's going to do. So uh, he goes up to the king and he says, listen, we've got to pull him out. And the king gave him the go-ahead. And he, and he gives 30 men to Jeremiah, which, I mean, in the beginning, the king's like, I can't really do anything. And then later on, he's like, here, have 30 men. Um, he just seems to flip-flop all over the place. My guess is that he, he just doesn't want Eben Malik to get thrown into the pit with Jeremiah, so he has this show of force with 30 men. But either way, he, he sends Eben Malik on his way with 30 men to pull Jeremiah out of the pit. But then something uh, kind of odd happens. Uh, he doesn't go to the, the cistern. He doesn't go to the pit where Eben Malik is. He takes a detour, and he goes to the palace. And he starts grabbing these rags and these worn-out clothes. And I can imagine that maybe one of the 30 men taps uh, Abimelech on the shoulder and says, okay, hey, um, I know, we, I thought we were going to go get him out of the, what are we doing here with, why are, what's with the rags, man? And, and I can just see Abimelech saying, like, I'm, I'm the one in charge, just trust me, let me do my thing. Just trust me, I got this. So he gets these rags and he, and he goes over to the pit. He's a planner. He's got a plan. So boldness, justice, uh, planner, and fourthly, tenderness. Verse 12. Abimelech the Cushite said to Jeremiah, put these old rags and worn out clothes under your arms to pad the ropes. 
Jeremiah did so. Well, that was, that was thoughtful, wasn't it? Ebed Melech is, is concerned for the well-being of Jeremiah. See, at, at this point uh, in Jeremiah's life, he's, he's an old man. He's weakened by his stays in prison. He's, he's malnourished from the seas, rations, and he's sunk pretty deeply in mud. You know, some of you may have been on canoe ships before, and you know that, that moment when you, you're taking the canoe and you're getting to the edge of the water, right, and you're about to go on land, and you step out too soon, and you, you sink into a bog or something, right? And your shoe just goes right down. And you know that to get your, your foot out, you have to be careful because if you pull out too quick, your, your shoe is going to stay in the mud because of all the suction that's in there. It's, it's going to take a couple really good tugs to pull Jeremiah out of this pit. And, and Abimelech, he is concerned. He's concerned that if they only drag him out with ropes, sure, we're going to get Jeremiah out of the pit, but he might not come out whole. He might not come out unscathed. And so he provides these rags and these clothes so that Jeremiah would come out whole. Tenderness. You know, Abimelech, he's really quite instructive for us because he's the one that God ordains to save someone else. In this case, to bring Jeremiah out of the pit. See, this unlikely character, he does what no one else in Jerusalem was willing to do. Right, we have the uh, officials in Jerusalem. They reject the message. And they throw Jeremiah into a pit to die. And then we have this uh, uncertain king, King Zedekiah, and he seems to be flip-flopping back and forth on his convictions on what to do about Jeremiah and his message and this and that. And, and then we have Abimelech, who rescues Jeremiah. And we have to ask the question, why? Why did he do it? Why did Abimelech even risk his own life doing this? Well, here's the answer. It's because he feared the Lord and he put his trust in him. Where am I getting that from? Well, turn forward one page in your Bible to chapter 39. Chapter 39, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. He's out of the pit at this point, and then, but the city is not destroyed yet. And he says, go to Abimelech, and tell him this message. Look at verse 16 of chapter 39. Go and tell Abimelech the Cushite. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. I'm about to fulfill my word against this city. Words concerning disaster, not prosperity. At that time, they will be fulfilled before your eyes. But I will rescue you on that day, declares the Lord. You will not be given into the hands of those you fear. I will save you. You will not fall by the sword, but will escape with your life. And here's, here's the line. Because you trusted in me, declares the Lord. You see, it was, it was by faith that Abimelech put his trust in God and he did what was right. And when the coming destruction was going to come upon Jerusalem, he's going to be saved. God used him to save Jeremiah, and God used him to change the trajectory of this whole story. Right at the end of uh, my first point, I tried to show you this, this downward trajectory of this story. Jeremiah went down. His position uh, was seemingly hopeless until God sent him Abimelech. And then the trajectory of the story changes. Right? You, can, you can picture in your mind uh, Jeremiah hears voices above him, and he looks up. And he sees the concerned face of Abimelech looking at him. And then the, the ropes get dropped down to him, and he, and he wraps them around himself, and he starts be, 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 uh, being pulled up. He was, he was as good as dead in that pit, but then he's resurrected from that fate, and he rose to the surface, up from death to life, up from, from hopelessness to hope. Up. So our Lord and Savior Jesus, he, he sunk as deep as was physically, emotionally, spiritually possible. And yet he, he remained without any sin. 
and every uh, facet of his being, he went down to, to the bottom of the bottom. The, the Apostles' Creed emphasizes this when it says, he descended into hell. But here's the reversal. After three days in the grave, he went up. He was resurrected up from death to life, up. And then he ascended into heaven, up. And he took his place at the right hand of God, up. And let me bring you back to Philippians 2. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Up. Now, I don't know you all, and I, and I don't know all of your hearts this morning, but I can imagine that um, there could be some sitting in this room or, or, or listening with us online and they, they hear the message. They hear the message of who Jesus is. They hear of the cross. We went through Easter. And in their hearts, they, they reject the message. Or maybe you know someone in your life, uh, someone very close to you, who rejects this message. Rejecting this message, it has huge consequences. In our story, rejecting the message meant total destruction. See, rejecting Jesus means that on the day of judgment, Jesus rejects you. That's a heavy warning. Or maybe this morning you, you relate more to King Zedekiah, right? You're, you're, you're maybe not quite sure what to think of the message. And maybe you, you kind of flip-flop a little bit. You have these, these questions, and maybe you have really big doubts. Maybe you're, you're not sure what to believe, or, or, or really if any of this is even true. And, and you just you can't commit to believing this message with your whole heart. And so you want to say, I want to say, Jesus, he knows your struggles. He knows your doubts. You know, he, he, he knows what you've done. He, he knows what's been done to you. He walked this earth and he entered into this pit so that he could save you. To save you from your guilt, from your shame, from your worries, from your questions even. And, and, and in no way do I want to uh, just gloss over the fact that you have questions or that you have doubts. And I don't want to trivialize that. And I, I truly believe that you keep working through them. I pray that you keep working through them. And you look for answers. But listen to me. You, you can commit to the message and still struggle. You can commit to the message of the cross, of the gospel, and still struggle. You can say the same thing as the man in Mark 9 who came up to Jesus and he said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You can say that today. You can say, Jesus, I believe. Please help my unbelief. And if you have surrendered your life to, to Christ and you, you've embraced him as your Savior, you'll know that even though uh, you embrace this good news, your life it doesn't immediately become perfect. Right? If, you, if you keep reading through Jeremiah, his situation certainly doesn't become perfect. You know, maybe today you're, you're, you're grieving loss and you, you feel it pulling you down. Or maybe physically or, or mentally you're, you're in pain every single second and you feel it just pulling you down. Or maybe today you're living with a, a sin that you've never confessed to anyone and you're just in that in that mud, in that down in that mud of, of, of shame and of guilt, and you feel like there's no way out. Maybe you're suffering from the hurt done to you or, or the hurt that you 
are, are, are still experiencing today. And you feel it pulling you down. The good news of the gospel from this passage is that uh, Jesus, in Jesus, you are united to him. You're united to him in his resurrection. And, and he promises you that he's going to lift you up from your shame and from your guilt and set you free. Up. He raises you to a new life. And he, he totally embraces all the beautiful characteristics we see in Abimelech. Because Jesus, he approaches you with boldness. He approaches you with justice on behalf for your sin. For, for a plan of redemption both now and into eternity. And Jesus comes to you in tenderness as one who can empathize with your weaknesses. And the best part of all is he, he gives you a promise. The same promise uh, that he gives to Jeremiah and Abimelech. He says, do not fear. Do not fear, for I will deliver you. This, this world is broken, but Jesus is coming back. And, and when he does, he is going to gather us up, and we will spend eternity with him with no more pain, with no more suffering, and with no more sin. That is the hope that we cling to. That is the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this story. Thank you for, for how it points us to Jesus. You saved us. You saved us from our hopeless situation of sin. We were lost in utter darkness. And you heard our cry for mercy from the pit. You gave us Jesus by sending him down so that we could be lifted up. Your, your love came and it set us free. And now, Lord, work it in our hearts to sing praises to your name. To the name that is above every name. The name in which every knee will bend and tongue confess. The name, Jesus Christ. You are Lord. Work your spirit in us, Father, that we may open our hearts to the truth of this gospel and allow it to shape our lives as we go boldly into this world and as we share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen.